Well, good morning, Oakwood. Glad that you're here with us this morning to celebrate 40 year, 40 year anniversary here this morning. It's been a great weekend already. Yesterday with the reception, a lot of the originals were here. Had a great time reminiscing, taking a stroll down memory lane. And today I want to introduce uh, to you the guest speaker because I actually booked him to come here nine years ago. Okay, that's how world-renowned he is to get on his speaking schedule. No, seriously, a uh, good friend, a uh, mentor of mine, Tim Harlow, is going to bring the message this morning. Uh, Tim uh, comes to us from Parkview Christian Church in Orland Park, Illinois, a suburb of the Chicago area. Uh, when he got there, it was like a church of about 125, and after long ministry there, uh, that church has grown. It's still a small church, about like 9,000 on a weekend, and so... Uh, Tim, Tim has uh, just seen the Lord work in just awesome ways. They've, they've actually baptized 9,000 people at his church since he got there. So praise the Lord for that. But uh, Tim, Tim is great. Uh, it's been really a privilege just to spend some time with him this weekend and to, and to talk to him. And so I'd like for you this morning to give a warm Oakwood welcome to Tim Harlow. Thanks, man. So I've been telling him no for nine years, and here I am. Hi, my name's Tim, and I'm from Illinois. Good, good, good. You guys are getting it. The last service was a little slow on the support group. This is, for those of you that don't, don't understand, you come to the group, you tell them what your problem is, and everybody feels sorry for you, okay? So let's just try it again and make sure everybody gets in on this, okay? Hi, everybody. I'm Tim. I'm from Illinois. It's been six years since our last governor was indicted. Okay, there, I'm done. Um, uh, I see, you know, I mean, I grew up here, okay? Uh, I don't like Chicago. I didn't want to move to Chicago, but 29 years ago, that's what God did. I got tired of it about 28 years ago, but that's where God put us, and we're still there. And it's, it's a mission field, okay? It's not Africa. It's not the Amazon, but it's different from Enid, Oklahoma, okay? I mean, the people talk funny. The weather's bad. They don't know what a moon pie is. I mean, they, they don't have no, they no idea. And the worst part is many of them are Cub fans. Can you imagine? Uh, I mean, that's, that's where I have to be. How could God do this to me? I don't even understand. Obviously, you don't know me if you would ask that question because it's penance, okay? That's what it is. It's punishment from God for, you know, all the things I did when I used to live here in Enid. I have to go to Chicago and be a pastor there. But, but seriously, I'm, I'm there. Uh, penance is kind of a fun term for me because 80% of the people in our area are Catholic grew up Catholic, and 80% of our church, the people that we've reached, grew up in a Catholic background. And I say that because I didn't know anything about the culture when I went there, okay? I grew up in Oklahoma. I thought the Hail Mary was a football play, right? <laughs> Now, I didn't have any idea, and for the, for the most part, I really love getting to minister to Catholics because there are people who have a, a deep level of wanting to have a faith but didn't necessarily know how the whole thing applied to their life. And so, a lot of times what happens is uh, we call them creasters, okay? They come on Christmas and Easter. That's their, that's their time. That's the thing that they do. They're, they grew up in this faith, and they know they're supposed to come. And so rather than, as I've gone into this new culture, rather than like, you know, fighting against it and griping about all the people that only come on Christmas and Easter, we decided to maximize it. We decided to maximize those opportunities and provide extra things and extra services. And, and last year at Christmas Eve, uh, we, it, which was over four days for us, we had 25,000 people in one of our 19 services at one of our three campuses. And we had 25,000 people there physically in our building for Christmas Eve. This year, and I did nine of them live. This year, we're going to do 23 services, start four days ahead of time. I will do 11 of them live because we just decided we're going to go in and, and we're going to reach the culture. So you're going to fight it or are you going to reach it? So this is what we do, okay? Um, it brings in some interesting people. After one of our Christmas Eve services, and I'll try to be uh, politically correct to the age of our listeners, um, one of my maintenance staff came up to me and said, hey, this was laying on the floor, and it was a, uh, a foil-wrapped pregnancy prevention device. Okay, you following me? I don't want to say it out loud, but, but that's what it was. Unopened, but somebody had dropped it in our sanctuary during a Christmas Eve service. The only thing that could go through my mind was, 
um, some guy was going to go to the club, you know, later on, and, uh, you know, and somebody invited him to a Christmas Eve service, and, and he decided to pull out some money maybe to give to buy coats in the inner city, which is what we were doing, and he dropped his in case of emergency, on the floor in my service. Those are the kinds of people that, that, that we were reaching. My only hope was that next year's baby Jesus wasn't the result of last year's Christmas Eve service. I, and I don't know, because we have a lot of them, so I don't, I don't know how the whole thing goes. At another one of our Christmas Eve services, I had one of my interns run up to me and go, hey, I think somebody's smoking pot in our men's bathroom. Remember, I'm from Illinois, not Colorado. I mean, this is not, this is not cool. And I, and I found out, sure enough, somebody just, you know, lit up a doobie, you know, right there in the bathroom. Didn't know any different because he was just coming to a Christmas Eve service. And I didn't know whether to be more concerned about the fact that somebody was smoking pot in the men's bathroom during Christmas Eve or the fact that my intern knew what pot smelled like. You know, I... I, I <laughs> So, so this, is, this is where God has brought me. I mean, forget about the moon pies and the, and the cubs. This is where God has brought me. And, and I know that a lot of Christians would feel uncomfortable with those kinds of people coming into their service, but I know one person who would not be uncomfortable with that, and it was the guy who invited him to his birthday party in the first place who said, you know what? It's not the healthy who need a doctor. It's the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus said he's the doctor and we're supposed to run a hospital. So, you know, people that need Jesus might not be all cleaned up and all well before they happen to show up. I've had to come to grips with that. Jesus said, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. Go out into the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. That's the reason that my dad and the elders of the Davis Park Christian Church started Oakwood Christian Church 40 years ago and called Joe Wilson to be the first preacher. And when a bunch of us worked together, I mean, I was in high school at the time, and I, I worked on the first building over here at Oakwood. It's because we knew that there were people around us that needed Jesus. They were, the, they were the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. They would leave things in the Christmas Eve service that they shouldn't have accidentally had in their pocket and dropped in the first place. They were, those, those were the people that we knew we needed to go reach. Not, not just all the people that were already Christians, but the ones that were outside. And that was the reason that this church ordained me 35 years ago. Here's my ordination certificate from 1983. Is that crazy? Um, and I want you to notice that I am cordially commended, okay? I don't know what that means, but I'm feeling good about it right now. I'm cordially commended. That, the, the, the elders of this church laid their hands on me and said, go be a preacher. And, and I think they said, go really far away from here and be a preacher. And so, so that's what I did, Okay. <laughs> And I think it's important that we recognize the history of what God has done with this place and we celebrate what God has done. I mean, that's super important because many of you have been drastically impacted by the ministry of Oakwood, like I have, okay? And God would always have us stop and remember the things that he has done. He, that's the Sabbath principle, right? But, but, but we can't stop here, okay? We have to pick up the ball and keep going, we can't be like the University of Oklahoma football team in the second quarter yesterday and, and just stop playing offense. Can I get an amen from you? Okay. Uh, I mean, we, we, have to, we have to go, yay, this good. The first quarter was good. You know, we got off to a good start. But what does the future have for us? And this is important because what's happening around us is that while during my lifetime, the United States of America has become the third or the fourth largest mission field in the world. We used to send our missionaries every, every place else, but if you look at just the amount of people that don't have Jesus, we're the third or fourth largest group of people in the world now. Why? Well, I think during this time period, when I was growing up, when, I, when, when I've been in ministry, during the, during the time of my life, the church has become inwardly focused. We've been focusing about ourselves and the things that we want to do and worried. We, we didn't want to be worldly. We didn't, we didn't want to, to become like the sick or the lame or the poor. We wanted to just huddle up in our own little groups, right? And we, and we got our own music 
after a while, you know? And we got our own radio stations, and we got our own bookstores. And, and back when I was in high school and college, people were going around saying, hey, look, we got to stay away from the world. As a matter of fact, you need to not listen to worldly music. You need to only listen to Christian music, which honestly was horrible back when I was in high school and college, okay? But, but they were like, you got you to burn. Uh, kids, you got you to understand, okay? They used to have these things called records, and... Um, You'd, you'd, put a, you'd put this thing on it, this needle, and it would go around and it would play. And the cool thing about it is it made out of vinyl. So when these people were going around saying, you need to burn your records, everybody's like, that's really cool. Because if you burn a record, it's just, it shrivels up really, really cool. And the people were going around the country saying, oh, you Christians, you need to separate from the world and you need to burn all your devil music. And you weren't supposed to just burn your devil music because of the words that you could hear on the devil music. Some of you are going to know what I'm talking about, but you should burn them because somehow if you play them backwards, are, are you, you know what I'm talking about? They had satanic messages in them backwards, which made me want to figure out how to get my turntable to go backwards, and I never could do it. I couldn't do it. And it was confusing to me back in the day because I was like, yeah, okay, all right, I, I get it. I should listen to this other stuff. But I got to tell you, when they got to the Eagles Hotel California record, I was like, nope, that's it. I am never burning that. Can I get an amen from you? Come on, okay? No, 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 we're not doing it. And I, I know it's got a goat on the front of it, and I, I get all that stuff, okay? I, I'm not saying that the lyrics were good. I'm not saying that we should be doing that. But there was this concept that was kind of messed up in the middle of it where we were supposed to separate away from the world, except Jesus told us we were supposed to be a hospital. You can't be a hospital if you close your doors to all the sick people, right? It was perfectly exemplified for me when Katy Perry first came on the scene um, her first song was about a lesbian experience, if you will, um, and a pastor in Ohio put this up on his marquee. I kissed a girl and I liked it, and then I went to hell. You have to pronounce it that way, hell. Now, now notice, notice the sheep up in the left-hand corner were finding and feeding his lost sheep as long as they're not on their way to hell. I bought into it too. Um, you know, when I was in Bible college, I went to Ozark Christian College in Joplin, Missouri. And uh, when a, a, a band has to play Joplin, Missouri, you know they're on their way out, okay? And uh, so, so when I was in high school, Alice Cooper was on his way out, and he was playing in Joplin, Missouri. And I remember for some reason, for one, one brief moment, I was in the holy group at Ozark Bible College, and I went with everybody to, I, I promise we did this, to picket the Alice Cooper concert. We, we were not there to, to, to like, you know, pray for these people, but we had signs and stuff, and people were yelling, Alice is a girl's name, and you know, you're singing about the devil, and, and, and they're yelling at us, and we're yelling at them, and I distinctly remember having this moment thinking, I don't think this is helping. I don't think this is what Jesus had in mind. See, the deal is, Oakwood, um, when the world thinks about Jesus, when they hear about Jesus, this is what they see. Right? Whether they believe he's the son of God or not doesn't matter. What they see is, is a guy who loved them so much that he died for them. But when the world thinks about the American church, I think that they see this. You know, you're not well enough for us. I really believe, all joking aside, that God brought me to my post in the Chicagoland area. He assigned me there because he needed to force me out of my comfort zone, to force me into a different perspective, to see people with the eyes of, of Jesus, and to learn how to do ministry in a completely different way. Because I think if I would have stayed in my, in my little bubble where I was and doing church the same old way, I wouldn't have been forced to grasp the realities that I needed to grasp in order to reach a very, very different culture than the one I grew up in. And I can tell you that what I figured out is that Jesus didn't come to the earth to die so that we could all huddle up and listen to our own little music and do our own little thing and then go home and feel good about ourselves and say, I hope it works out for you. Here's your, here's your billboard, okay? Here's your picket sign. I hope you figure this out. 
Eric shared this verse last week, and, and I realized when I was looking at my ordination program, which is out there in the, in the museum, um, that, that had the program there, and this verse was in it. I thought it's pretty important. Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and they were helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Do you see what the key was? It was right there in the middle. The key was compassion. You can't have compassion for God's sheep by putting a, a, a marquee out and telling them how bad they are. See, I don't think the problem is seeing the harvest. I don't think the problem is even praying about the harvest. I think the problem is giving a rip about the harvest. Jesus had compassion on those who needed the gospel, those who needed it the most, those who were going to smoke pot in the men's bathroom during the Christmas Eve service. Those are the ones that Jesus was around. Those are the ones he had compassion on because they were sheep without a shepherd. The church I went to 29 years ago, as Eric said, it was, it was a mess. I, it was a call of God. I mean, it really, really was. It was running 150 people on the weekend. There were no elders, no leaders, because there were two groups doing infighting with each other, and they'd run off all the leaders of the other group. And it was a church planting organization that had a kind of a, you know, a, an IV running into the thing, and it was just barely alive. There was one part-time secretary. It was a terrible old building in a terrible location, and for some reason, that's where God called us. And my wife and I felt really, really called. But I very soon discovered that if there was a reason that the Tilly Park Church of Christ, Christian church back in that day, wasn't reaching its community, it's because they just didn't care about their community. They cared about themselves and their stuff. I had a deacon tell me one time, we should put a fence around the property so that the kids wouldn't come in and leave trash in, in the parking lot. And I remember thinking, Wow, that is the exact opposite of what the church is supposed to be doing. The exact opposite. Let me take you to an Old Testament story today. It's probably one that you're familiar with if you've been around Sunday school before, if you've ever been around. It's going to be something that's going to be familiar to you. It's the story of Jonah, all right? But I don't think you know the story of Jonah for the right reason. The story of Jonah about this guy who's supposed to go on a mission to these people that he doesn't want to go to, so he runs away, he gets tossed in the ocean, big fish comes in and swallows him, he's in there for three days, he gets spit back up on the shore. You know this story, right? And God said, okay, Jonah, want to try that again? And Jonah said, yes, absolutely. That's not the crazy part of the story, believe it or not. The crazy part of the story is the mission actually worked. Listen to this. And Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Okay, yeah, no kidding he did after being in the fish. And when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, these are bad people. Jonah doesn't like them. I mean, they're really evil, bad people. The king of Nineveh said, uh-oh, let everyone call urgently on God. Let's give up our evil ways and turn from violence. Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from His fierce anger so that we will not perish. In other words, the king of all these bad people, and this was a big town, the king of all these bad people said, hey, God said we should repent, turn around. Let's do it. And all the people said, okay. Okay. I mean, it was literally that easy. That's all Jonah had to do was go do this one thing that he'd been running from. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, right? I believe that, Oakwood. I, I do. I believe that. And, and what's really crazy is when you put it into perspective in time, okay? Here's a graph of, uh, of you know, history. Let's just call this yellow stripe here. That's our, that's our history, okay? 50 years on either side of the year 2000. Now, watch what happens when we go to this next slide and I show you world population. All right? Uh, you know, zero, 500, 1,000. I don't know what was going on. People weren't getting together. There were plagues. There were wars. Uh, you know, there's, there's no big deal, right? Until you get into our generation. And then what happens? Many of us remember 3 billion people, 4 billion people, 5 billion people, 6 billion people, 7 billion people. The world has grown through our time. So the question for me always is why did God put me here? Why didn't he put me a 1,000 years ago? 
Why did God put Oakwood Christian Church here to be 40 years in the middle of that yellow window when everything is growing and people are, 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 are multiplying and there's more and more people around us? Why did he put us there? It, it, the harvest is plentiful. What should we do about it? That's been affecting me for about 10 years, realizing how important it is that I am here now. We have a big presence on the internet. We, we, do, we do a lot of mission. We do a lot of things. And God continues to help us as we grow this thing because I just can't let go of it. I can't let go of it. I'm here for now. And so are you. And the king of Nineveh was receptive. And I believe the people around us would be receptive if we saw them as sheep without a shepherd. If we had compassion. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he wept over them. What did we do? We set up a picket line. We told them they were going to hell. So when your Sunday school teacher taught you about Jonah and put up the little flannel graph and you know all that stuff, the story was don't run from God or you're going to end up like Pinocchio, right? I mean, that's basically what we do with, with the Jonah thing. But that's not the story. Listen to this. God had compassion and did not bring upon the destruction he had threatened. What did God have? What did Jesus have? What did Jonah not have? Compassion. The real story of Jonah is in chapter 4. We always skip over that. But to Jonah, <laughs> this seemed very wrong. What seemed wrong? That God had compassion? He, yeah. That just, that just seemed wrong to Jonah. And he became angry at God for having compassion. He prayed to the Lord. Dadgummit. That's in the Hebrew. You can't read it in your Bibles. Dadgummit. God, I, I knew that you were gracious. I knew that you were compassionate. Man, that bugs me. I knew you were slow to anger and abounding in love. And you're a God who relents from sending calamity. I knew that's who you were. I'm so mad at you, I want to die. Amen. Take away my life. It's better for me to die than live. Are you kidding me? I'm not kidding you. Jonah didn't run from God because he was afraid of the Ninevites. Jonah ran from God because he didn't like the Ninevites. He didn't want God to save them. He fled to Tarshish because he was worried that God might actually do something good, like the good God that he is. And Jonah didn't want to have anything to do with it. Jonah's problem was compassion. He was like the kid that was telling the other kid about Jesus in heaven. And an unbelieving kid was like, oh, so you mean all I have to do is, is believe in Jesus and I can go to heaven? And if my mom wants to go, all she has to do is believe in Jesus? And the other kid said, yeah. And if you don't want her to go, just don't tell her. <laughs> I, that, was, that was Jonah chapter 4. He just didn't want them there. And ultimately... If, if, I can, if I can challenge us a little bit, ultimately, that's our problem. I mean, who wants the kingdom of God to be filled with Ninevites, right? And tax collectors and prostitutes and Katy Perry's and Alice Cooper's. Who wants that? Jesus told a, a parable about a Pharisee one day who got up and prayed, I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. He points to the guy who's there. And the tax collector looked up to heaven and said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, the tax collector went home justified, not the guy who didn't care about anybody else and thought he was all that. Jonah said, I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. That doesn't seem like a bad thing if you're on the other side of it. But if you've already got it, it's kind of hard to share. And, and Jonah knew that God was a God of second chances because God sent a giant fish to give him one. So Jonah went out east of the city, made himself a shelter, sat in the shade, and waited to see what would happen. 
Okay, I mean, seriously, he, 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 he hated the Ninevites so much. All right, you guys, if you turn to God, he's probably going to forgive you. And they go, oh, okay, and they turn to God. And then he's like, oh, I can't believe it, God. I can't believe you're going to save these people. And then he goes off east of the city, and he sits there, and he's thinking, maybe God will change his mind. Maybe God's going to fry those boogers. Maybe that's going to happen. I'm going to sit here, and I'm going to watch. This is literally who Jonah is. And unfortunately... It's literally who a lot of God's followers are from time to time. He went out to a place east of the city, waited to see what was going to happen. And the Lord decided to do a little object lesson. He provided a vine and he made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head, to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm and chewed the vine so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind. We know what that's like. And the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that it would grow faint. And he wanted to die. He's got a little bit of an issue. And he said, it would be better for me to die than live. And then God confronted him. Here's the object lesson. Do you have a right to be angry about the vine, Jonah? I do, he said. And and, and God's going to say... No you, no, you don't, because the, you didn't cause the vine to grow, and, and you, you have no business being worried about whether it grows or not. You should, you should be concerned about the things that are somebody else's, he said. You've been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh, and I'll process this for you, has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about this great city? The great thing about studying the Bible, you, you read over that, you're like, I don't even, uh, what does that mean? That, you know, 120,000. What that is, is a, it's a euphemism for children. When you, when you get into the Hebrew, what you're going to find out is that the, the phrase, do not know their right hand from their left, means they're not old enough to make decisions for themselves. So what God is saying is he's saying, okay, I, I know it was hot out, and I provided the vine, and then it went away, and you're mad about the vine, but you don't even care that there are 120,000 children in Nineveh, and I was going to destroy, I was going to wipe out the whole city because it was evil. Should I not be concerned about 120,000 children? Should I not be concerned? about their cattle? Should I not be concerned about the rest of their life? This is what God is trying to say. How could you be so cold-hearted, Jonah? They weren't yours in the first place, but how could you not care? All Jonah cared about was his vine. And what did the vine represent? The vine, people, represented his comfort. Jonah didn't care about 120,000 kids that might be wiped out. All he cared about was that his shade was gone. And when his shade was gone, he was out of his comfort zone. Leaving Israel and going to Nineveh in the first place meant leaving his comfort zone. (laughs) Moving me from Enid, Oklahoma to the suburbs of Chicago was about leaving my comfort zone. And I'm here to tell you that the only way to reach the people outside of our walls, whether it's in Enid, Oklahoma or in the suburbs of Chicago or in Zimbabwe, the only way to reach the people outside of our walls and the only reason for Oakwood to, to exist for 40 more years is for us to get outside of our comfort zone. The the only way for this church to move forward is if it goes forward with the same attitude that the people who are listening to me right now that were a part of that group 40 years ago had when they left their comfort zone over at Davis Park Church this nice building that was already there and paid for, and they decided to, to come over to the other side of town and, and put a group of people together and leave their comfort zone and start another church. That's how this thing got started. And the only way this thing goes forward is if the same thing happens. And I'll give you a mental thing for you to remember this by, is if our compassion is greater than our comfort. Because what happens to churches when they're 40 years old, what happens to churches, period, is we get in a comfort zone and it becomes about us and our stuff and how we like it. But our compassion has to be greater than our comfort zone. And that means personally. One of the big lessons God did with me was bringing this guy into my life several years ago. Mike, he's an ex-Hells Angel, uh, ex-drug dealer, 
and he can bench press a small truck, obviously. And I was at the gym one day. If you did the Life on Mission stuff, you heard the story of Mike. And by the way, I got some books out there if you did never get one back in the day. Uh, he was a guy who was just, you know, imp- imposing, right? So I'm at, the, I'm at the health club one day, and I'm walking in between some of the equipment, and I see him there, and my, my opening line, here's your, here's your evangelism 101 lesson, okay? You ready for this? My opening line was, hey, man, how you doing? That was it. And really, that was just my way of saying, dear sir, if I'm in your way, please don't kill me. Really? Okay? You know what I mean? And, and, and again, if you, if you did the small group stuff, you saw, you saw, you saw about his story. I mean, it, it's been an amazing journey. I mean, there have been a lot of people in my life, but in my own life, my, my compassion had to be greater than my comfort. And there was a defining moment on that. It was when we were working out one day in, in the health club, and he showed up in a strip club t-shirt. Okay? And I don't know if there's such a thing as an inoffensive strip club t-shirt, but he was not in one of those. He was in an offensive strip club t-shirt. And I got to tell you, I have have three daughters. I am really, really, really against strip clubs. And everybody in the health club knows who I am. Half of them go to my church, and everybody knows who I am. And here's Mike, and we're going to work out. And I'm like, dude, you got to change your shirt. No, I'm not going to do it. No, you get, I mean, this is before he came to Christ. You, you, you gotta, that, that's offensive to me. I mean, th- that's offensive to everybody. You've got to change it. No, turn it inside out at least. No, I'm not going to do it. And I had this moment where I had to decide, was my compassion going to be greater than my comfort? And, and I, don't, I don't know if I made the right decision, but I decided that I didn't care what people were going to say about me working out with Mike. I cared about him. And I'll admit, as we worked out, I kind of like, stood around him the whole time so that nobody could really see what was on his shirt as best as I could. I was really, really uncomfortable, but my compassion had to be greater than my comfort. And there were a lot of moments like that in our friendship along the way. But you don't get to this moment, this is Mike getting baptized in the tub, unless you have compassion greater than comfort moments over and over again. And you don't get to baptize, you don't get to see people come to Christ as a church unless your compassion is greater than your comfort. And it may mean taking you out of your comfort zone over and over and over again. And it took people out of their comfort zone 40 years ago, and it's going to happen again. C.T. Studd said, some wish to live within the sound of the chapel bell, but I want to run a mission a yard from the gates of hell. And people, that's where we are. That means Oakwood's compassion is, it's got to be greater than its comfort. That's how we keep the ball going in the second half. And the problem was that Jonah just didn't see the Ninevites the way that God saw them. God saw them as his children. How could, you, how could I not be concerned about this great city? When you process it that way, when I processed that Mike, with all of his problems, was God's child, then it made me get outside of my comfort zone and love him. Have you lost a child? Because, I mean, I know as I ask that question, some of you have literally. Um, have you lost a child even for a little while? You know what it's like to have that feeling as a parent? not knowing where your kid is when they're young. Now, for us, it was uh, the most drastic one, was losing our four-year-old daughter, Becca, on the beach in North Carolina. She got separated from her cousins, and all of a sudden we realized that she was nowhere around. She was four. And this was before cell phones, you know. So we alerted the lifeguards. My wife ran north on the beach, and I ran south on the beach. And I mean, we flew. And we left everybody in the middle to watch for her if she came back. And the beach was crowded that day. And you know what goes through your thoughts as a, as a parent, you know. I mean, she, she wasn't a good swimmer yet with the ocean. And there are bad people around, and you just don't know what's, what's going on. That's the feeling I, I want you to remember when you think about the people outside of our walls. And I ran faster than an Olympic runner because of the passion inside. And I'd stop and I'd say, have you seen a little brunette four-year-old in a pink Barbie bathing suit? And people say, no, no, no. And, and it, they kind of were alarmed with me, you know, the people were. And, and we'd keep going, we'd keep going. And I ran and I ran and I ran. And I, it was a half a mile at least down the beach when I finally found Becca. <laughs> and then you have that moment, you know, as a parent where you're like, oh, relieved and you just want to yell at them and and you realize she's four and she's scared so it was just like 
Hi, Becca. What you doing? Right? You know me? And Becca turned and looked at me, and what did she do? She broke down crying. Because she knew she was lost. I didn't need a marquee. I didn't need a picket sign. Just needed to put my arms around her. And then I had another problem. Because I knew her mother was dying a slow death on the other side of the beach, not knowing that Becca was okay. And then it was my job to put her on my shoulders and run her just as fast back up the other way to a parent who couldn't stand that her child wasn't home. And that's the reason for Oakwood Christian Church. And that's the mission that has to drive us forward. Let's pray. Lord, as I woke up early this morning and went out to Meadow Lake to walk around for old time's sake, I was just overwhelmed, as you know, praying for this church and thinking about the people in this room who used to care about me when I was a, a child who didn't know my left from my right, and, and they spoke you into my life, and they cared about me. <clears throat> I thank you for those people that, that, that took care of me and helped me find my way along the way, and now, Lord, it's my turn, and, and there have been people that have done that in my kid's life and now grandkids' life, and, and it's amazing what happens as it goes forward, but I was overwhelmed with this sense of... of of what the purpose of this church was when it was founded 40 years ago and how important it is that we remember it as we go forward, that we pick up the ball and we keep moving forward on offense. Lord, they're your kids. We need to care about them the way that you did. And you sent your only son to die for them, that whoever believes in them Ninevites, tax collectors, prostitutes, Katy Perry, me, would not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you. Help us to be those people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.